Hello and a very warm welcome to this latest edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is a remarkable woman. Let me introduce you to her first and then I'll tell you why she is so remarkable. But here she is first, Maika Vinnemood. Thank you Hi. very, very much for joining us here today on Talking Germany. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Great stuff. Now, uh, Maika Vinnemood had already established herself as a successful writer and journalist, but then something else happened. She went on the uh, German version of the very successful and popular TV show who wants to be a millionaire and she won half a million euros she then decided to live in 12 different cities around the world a month each over a period of a year and published a best-selling book about her adventure it's a really really good story i think it sounds great when you say that in english <laughs> my goodness <clears throat> Excuse me, it's a very good book as well. Oh, it's, it's selling very well. I know that yeah. because when I went, I decided I needed to read it and I went out and I went, <laughs> to, a, I, I went to one bookshop and they said, oh, we've just sold it. Yeah, we don't what? have it in stock. And I went to another one. Oh, we've just sold it. Nope. Yeah. Got to um, be kidding me. That's great. No, no, it's doing very, very well. We're not going to talk about the book first. We'll talk about the book second. Let's talk yes. about the show first. Absolutely. People always ask you, I know, what it felt like to be sitting there and to be told you have won half a million euros. I'd like to know what happened next. What happened after that? When you, you'd been told you'd won the money. Yeah, we you know, uh, first of all, you don't really realize what happened, right? You, you don't feel happy at all. You just feel overwhelmed. You mm -hmm. just don't know what happens to you. You know, there's no way you can uh, rehearse for a situation like that. No. So you are obviously <laughs> at, at your wit's end. I was anyway. Yeah. And thank God for my best friend, Katarina, who accompanied, uh, who went with me during the Of course, the you can always take a friend yeah, along. Yeah, you can take she a friend. She was the one yeah. in the studio. Yeah, yeah. and she's, um, she's kind of calmed me down afterwards. And I was really frantic. I, I was frazzled. And she said, let's go and get some pasta. And then let's see what happens. So, so just do something, something very basic, something very mundane yeah. to uh, calm down. And eating noodles always the best thing you can do in any situation, I think. What about the money? How had, uh, how had that been? Had, the, had that been arranged in advance so that you'd actually given them your, you know, the number for your account and all that kind of stuff? How does oh, that yeah, work? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they ask you after the show. Mm -hmm. They ask you... Straight um, after the show. You, straight the after the in? show, you, you just sit there. They, they sit you down in, in some kind of a couch and... Then a girl comes and hands you a piece of paper and says, could you please jot down your uh, account details? And I, uh, okay, I better not get this wrong, right? So you have to concentrate very hard on the correct number. Obviously, they, they what, found it. What were you doing there in the first place? Why had, you, why had you chosen to try to go on the show and then to get on the show? Well, you know, you know I like to take chances. Uh -huh. I'm very fond of little experiments mm -hmm. and of um, getting myself into situations which I can't totally control, which, you know, this show is the ultimate uncontrollable situation. I like, I like little adventure trips, uh, everyday adventure trips, and this is a fairly good one, I thought. So I thought, yeah, why not try it? Uh -huh. And there you were, you were sitting on yeah. the show, yeah? You took a risk, you, the yeah, one like that you the, haven't quite mentioned, which is the fact that you were already an established journalist with a, with a very successful career. Yeah. You know, magazines, newspapers and what right. have you. And you come from a profession, I know it, where people, you know, they, they can sometimes be know-it-alls. Journalists need to be people who are well-informed, of course. Mm. So you could have, you were running the risk of sort of, you know, yeah. Yeah. Many people going out right at yeah, the beginning. That's yeah. right. Many people ask me afterwards if I weren't afraid that I might, you know, blunder a really easy question and then embarrass myself. And I said, they ask, what about your reputation? You could have, you know, risk your reputation. I thought, you know, I'd rather have a reputation of taking risks and occasionally falling flat on my face Good than a you. reputation of not trying at all, you know? Mm -hmm. What's the fun of that, to be always on the safe side and play it safe, have a middle-of-the-road kind of life? No, I like to take risks, really. Obviously, you can fail, but then again, you know, what's life other than the occasional failure? <laughs> Did you have colleagues who you knew were watching? I didn't know they were watching, but I assumed they might be watching. I think there were about 8 million people watching this particular show, so... Mm. I assume some people I know must have watched it and obviously they did afterwards. I got a lot of text messages and said, you've mm -hmm. got to be crazy, congratulations and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. We perhaps should just mention it. In each country, I know from the countries where I've seen the show, the the, the, the presenters of the show, the host, mm -hmm. they tend to be sort of really iconic TV figures. Yeah. yeah. Gunther Jauch, yeah. is, is yeah. he's, he's very much that here in Germany. He yeah? is, I think. They always uh, peg him to be the, you know, president of Germany or something mm -hmm. because he's very popular, I think, yeah. the most popular TV personality, yeah. And did you have good chemistry with him? Because, I mean, it, yeah. it, my impression is that he will help or hinder people a wee little bit. Was he yeah. helping you or hindering you? I was a bit worried about that Ooh. because he, when I, you know, I got there, he said, I know you. And I said, oh, my goodness. Oh, uh, right. I just that read. That is intimidating. Um, yeah, yeah, he mm -hmm. said, I read, just read something you wrote uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I said, oh, no, this can be good or bad. Mm -hmm. And he uh, quoted from this piece I wrote for the Süddeutsche Zeitung magazine, and he obviously seemed to like it, so I went like, whew. <laughs> and he was quite nice, actually. He didn't, uh, he didn't try to, to throw me off. He mm -hmm. was all right. He was like a colleague almost, mm -hmm. yeah. OK, and at the beginning of the show, Gunti Jauch always introduces the guests. Once you've got through, the, there's that tough initial thing where you've got to, where the, there's the, 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 the hurdle you've got to get yeah. over of winning against the others. Yes, yeah? yeah. What was your time there, by the way? I have no idea. Yeah? Four you must seconds have been very something. quick. Yeah, four, four seconds something, I OK, believe. and then yeah. you're called up to answer the big questions, mm. the big money questions, and he introduces you. What, how did he introduce you? Well, you said I'm a journalist, that's all. That's all? Yep. OK, Doug. Micah, you, you, uh, you, we, we, we've discovered already that you're a person who's into risk, into experiment, into taking yeah. risks. The, 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 the year-long experiment with the, with the blue dress. Mm -hmm. I, I still haven't got my head around it quite. Explain <laughs> that to me. Yeah? Well, you know, I read somewhere that you normally wear just about 10% of your wardrobe. You know, you have your favourite sweater, your favourite pair of jeans, and the rest just lives there in your cupboard. I think I know what you mean. Yeah. No, no. So, and I thought that's totally true when it mm. comes to me. I felt, yeah, I thought, yeah, that's right. So I decided why not just have this this 10% and I'm a very, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lover of extremes. So I thought, why not have just one dress, one, one single dress and try and make it work. Try to look different every single day with just one dress and it worked, really it did. But it wasn't just one item, was it? No, it was, it was a look. you know. It was one dress. I had it in three. Uh, I had three, oh, three. Uh, three dresses. They were exactly the but same. There were trousers as well, yeah. Or there, were there, was no. there a longer, shorter? No, no, no. no. Just, just the dress. Yeah, yeah, just the dress. And what was the, you know, what did you learn? What was the philosophy of the blue dress? Well, easily, uh, what you learn with something like that is you don't need very much, or not mm -hmm. as much as you think you might need. You can make do with just one item of clothing mm -hmm. uh, if you. If you play around with it a little bit, with accessories and, and stockings and, and scarves and stuff like that, so it does really, it really does work. And I had another thing going during that year. I gave away one item from my belongings every day. I just put it on the on the internet and say, this I want to get rid of. Who wants it? And that was great. So I got rid of 365 things in my life. And it was a very liberating experience. I found. Oh, sure. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Mm. Wow. In your book about your, your journey, uh, you, you, you don't just write chapter for chapter, city for city. You write to people. And it's, yes, it's an interesting picture. Is... Some of them are your friends. Mm. One, one, uh, one chapter is actually written to a younger version of yourself, which yeah. I thought was very interesting and very, very touching. And there's also a chapter you write to your parents. Now, I'm not quite sure where it is in the book, but uh, there's, one, mm -hmm. yeah, there's one section, though, where you say to your parents they did something very, very right Yes. around 1960 or so well, and the years some, after that. They did something very right. They neglected me in the best possible way. Ugh. You know, they, <laughs> <I like> were, <laughs> <laughs> they were not like uh, helicopter parents, as they are called these yeah. days, you yeah. know, always hovering over their children and watching each and every step. But my parents just let me go. And they didn't know where I was most of the time during the day. And they said, uh, she will be home when she's hungry. And I was. And I could go my own ways. And they never worried about me. And maybe that's why I like to, you know, explore everything. And I'm not afraid of the world. Because mm -hmm. they taught me not to be afraid. And they taught me to be, you know, self-confident. 
Yeah, I think it's the best way of neglect one can possibly experience in a very young age. Absolutely fantastic, yeah. As somebody who's actually brought up two children in my life, and then, you know, that's a lesson. I don't know how good I was on that scale. I think I was quite good, yeah, right. but I'm a worrier as well at some times. Um, you've said of yourself you're somebody who likes to stick her nose in. Yeah. Is that the journalist in you or the you in you? Um, bit of both, I think. Mm. The journalist is a great excuse to be me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a great role that one is allowed yes. to play. Yeah. yeah, you know, you are allowed to stick your nose in everything, which kind of interests you, and yeah. get paid for yeah. doing that. That's yeah. the greatest thing about it. Yeah. No, I could be as curious as I want, uh, as I want it, and I can always call it. It's my profession. I'm sorry. It's obviously it's just my personal curiosity, but. Yeah. I can, yeah, I can declare it to be of higher value because it's journalism. Very good. There you were sitting on the show and Gunter Jauch always asked the people, if you were to win a substantial sum of money, what would you do? Had you prepared your answer in advance? I knew that he would ask that question, obviously. Mm. He always does. So I thought beforehand, well, actually, what would I do? Mm. You know, you, you start to dream and start to think about your dreams. And then obviously my, it, it's always been a lifelong dream to travel and travel extensively for a long, long period of time. So that was the obvious answer. And it's because I love cities because, and I love people yeah. who, tend to love, uh, who tend to live in cities. Um, <laughs> I decided to live in 12 different cities for one year. And that was the idea, yeah. Let's play a little game, yeah? Mm -hmm. I'll name one of the cities, you name one of the other ones until we've got all 12 covered. Because oh, I'm, no sure I'm sure the, uh, the viewers at home are interested to know, because we keep talking about these 12 cities and one or two, they, they'll have seen them visually already sure. and heard about them. So I'll begin. San Francisco. Uh, Sydney. Honolulu. Buenos Aires. Havana. Um, Mumbai. Bombay, Mumbai. Yeah. Whoa, yes. Uh, Addis Ababa. Shanghai. Uh, have we had Tel Aviv already? Yeah, I think okay. we have. Barcelona. London. London. Copenhagen. Um, what's That's the missing? Lot, I think. What's missing? Tel Aviv. Sydney. Sydney Tel, Aviv. Tel Aviv. Okay. Yeah. The toughest city, I guess. Barcelona. Barcelona. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the toughest city from what you... Uh, no, tell me this first of all. Where did you stay in all these cities? Oh, I, d I decided to live a very everyday kind of life. I didn't want to stay in hotels and especially not five-star hotels, as everyone assumed, me having won this uh, huge amount of money. No, I wanted to live a very regular kind of normal life. I uh, wanted to feel like, like, like one of the inhabitants. So I rented apartments, furnished apartments. There are a lot of internet platforms where you can do it, airbnb.com, for mm. instance, or sabbaticalhomes.com. Easily, uh, you find the most beautiful apartments in the middle of the city. And not just apartments, you had a house in London, yeah? No, was I, that house. was an, an apartment. apartment. It okay. just it felt like a house. <laughs> Tell the viewers the story behind the house. Oh, that's pretty funny, apartment. actually. I, I was looking for a place in London uh, on uh, this uh, platform, sabbatical.home, sabbaticalhomes.com, sorry. And I found a place which looked very nice. And I uh, wrote to the guy who uh, owns it. And it turned out to be uh, Carl Jarassi. Professor Carl Jarassi, he's the inventor of the birth control pill, the pill, the father of the pill. He calls himself the mother of the pill. Very fascinating guy. Very man. fascinating guy. He's 89 now. He will be 90 in uh, October and he dreads it. I got to know him very well. We got talking, we got mailing. He speaks German because he's an Austrian Jew which left, who left the country in 1938. So he still reads and speaks excellent German. And he could read my blog, my web blog, and he, uh, he noticed that I wanted to come to San Francisco also. And mm -hmm. so he offered me his guest apartment in San Francisco. I was, so I was twice his guest in San Francisco and in London. And it turned into a quite a nice friendship, despite the age difference. He wouldn't... He wouldn't notice the age difference. He obviously thinks he's like in his 40s. <laughs> he's a real character. He's great. Yeah. <laughs> There you are, scribbling your notes. Uh, when, 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 you, uh, when you were making, drawing up the list of the 12 cities mm. that you were going to visit, how near to the top was Tel Aviv? Very near to the top, really. I think oh. it was this, uh, I wanted to go to Tokyo, Tel Aviv. Those were the first two cities I jotted down. And why and, Tel Aviv then? You know, uh, I always wanted to go to Israel. I've never been. And I, I don't think it's, it's um, um, you have to as a German. That's not what I'm saying. But I think there's a special connection between Germany and Israel, and I was really curious. I just wanted to get to know this country, and, and 
get an idea what it's all about there. You know, you it's, it's one of those countries which you think you know, but you only watch news and you uh, in the news you always have a new explosion, a new threat, a new attack, a new this and that. And I thought this can't be the country. So when you got there and you got to a different level, what did you find? I met a lot of people who live there mm. and uh, it, it obviously is not a normal life, but they try to lead a normal life mm. uh, despite the circumstances, which I think is incredible. I met a very nice couple. She's a German woman married to an Israeli guy, hot guy, by the way, <laughs> as most of them are. Israelis are often men and, and women are like a very good looking people. They yeah? are. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Jesus was a good looking guy too. Sorry. Um, and he, uh, they invited me to their home and I was quite surprised to find that they had, um, what's a keller? A um, keller downstairs? Like a, 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 a basement. A basement? A basement. For... They had to have a basement which was enforced for bomb exactly. attacks. Mm -hmm. the, like a bunker almost, exactly. right? Yeah. yeah. And that uh, they have to build each new house has to have one of those. They mm -hmm. that's that's uh, the law there. That was a shock to you. That was a total shock to that me. Just imagine home. that. Yeah. 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 He uses that. That guy is a sommelier. He uses it for his wine collection, so in a very mm -hmm. mundane way. But still, they have to build a bunker under the house. But it's that interesting. Is crazy... I mean, it's interesting that you chose Tel Aviv and not Jerusalem, because because um, Tel Aviv is on the coast. It's just up the coast right. from from Gaza, right. for example. Right. Yeah. And it's so strange because Tel Aviv. I've been there myself it, uh, quite a long while ago, but I don't think much has changed. It's still a city that's very much associated with, you know, the beach and cafes sure. and clubs, and it's a good time kind of it's a city. It's a very hedonistic how does that, kind of city. How does that work? It's a very hedonistic kind of a city. I don't know. It's, uh, as you said, it's about 60 miles north of Gaza or even closer. I'm mm. not quite sure. And on a day I was there on the beach, uh, there were attacks flown over Gaza. Mm. And no, you wouldn't know it. You just wouldn't know it. People are sitting there enjoying the sun or doing some um, rope fishing or something. It's just amazing. I don't know how they do it. Despite everything, I just don't. Mm. Uh, it's, it is possible, obviously. Mm. They prove it is. Mm. And you'd chosen to visit the city, Tel Aviv, which is maybe less religious as a city is, in yeah. terms of the character of the city than Jerusalem. But nevertheless, there were important holy days, like Yom Kippur when you were there, and that yes. made an incredible impression on you. I think yeah. you were possibly a little bit naive. You didn't know quite exactly sort no. of what it all uh, I didn't know amounted what it to. It didn't know what it entailed at all. I didn't yeah. know that. I knew it was the most important holy day in Israel, but I didn't really know what it was like. And it was everything just totally slows down and, and um, shuts down. Mm. The city shuts down. There is no bus service. Uh, you, you can't fly into uh, Israel on that day at all because the airport is closed. Mm. It's also. a very profound statement, yes. really. Yeah. yeah. It's like everything just shuts down. There's no radio, no t TV, nothing. Mm. And you can walk the streets, the autobahns, and there's no, there's no car driving there. And just crazy. It's like so, so quiet that I, I, I couldn't believe it. I really enjoyed that. I walked around and listened to the silence. Actually. And experiences like that in the Holy Land made you think about your own beliefs and your own values. You can't not think about that when you are in a country like that. You really start thinking well, what's important to me, what are my values, my beliefs, and yeah, you do a little inventory in a way. And when you got home, when you got back to Hamburg, what did you bring back with you in terms of what you'd learned and what you wanted to sort of bring into your life after your journey? Oh, that's really hard to answer because there was such a lot. I, um, you know, I really enjoyed being on the road and didn't have any problems living out of a suitcase for a year, mm. out of a 20 kilo suitcase, though I really didn't miss anything on the road. So I decided I want to uh, keep the, the lightness, the levity of traveling in my life. And I decided to move from my very big old apartment to a very small new apartment, so mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. 40 so square you meters. Down. I sized down mm -hmm. even more than I did before. Um, I want the levity, I want the, the lightness, I want to keep that in my life. And also, what did I bring home? A very profound idea that the world is a very friendly place mm -hmm. once you go there and actually talk to people. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a great amount of gratitude for uh, being born in one of the, the, the safest, cleanest uh, mm -hmm. 
countries in the world, Germany? It's, it's, it's interesting. A, a phrase comes to mind that I remember from reading the book that you, when you talk about people's, uh, people's attitudes to each other, you, talk, you say that one of your sort of core beliefs has become a belief in, the, in random acts of kindness. That's true, yeah. I it's an interesting that. point. That's, yeah. um, you, can, you can trust in the comfort of strangers. You really can. It's amazing mm -hmm. how nice the world is and the people is. And random acts of kindness is, was always a... a, a a uh, concept which I liked a lot, you know, mm -hmm. just be friendly to without expecting anything back. Mm -hmm. Just be friendly. And somehow it seems to work. It, you generate a kind of uh, great atmosphere when you do that. And somehow you, I don't believe in karma, but you get it back, I think. Okay, and just one small point, but it's a very big point, in fact, is that what you, came, what you concluded after your journey and writing the book was that you could have done the whole thing yeah. without the money that you won on the show. That was kind of crazy to me, yes. That was, um, it, 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 I, I was gobsmacked when I realized that. I continued working as a journalist on the road, not because I had to, because I wanted to. And once uh, your job turns into, you know, leisure as opposed to a chore, uh, a labor of love, if you want. Um, it, it's so easy. I, I so enjoyed it all of a sudden, and I earned enough money for paying, you know, for this whole trip, for the the, um, the air travel, for the apartments, and um, for my for the cost of living. So in the end, I realized I could have done it all along. I just it never occurred to me. Yeah. <sighs> Amazing. There is a lesson for us all, oh, and yeah. whether people like me are going to learn the lesson. <laughs>
And just to go back to the movie, I, I mentioned it has been shown at the, uh, the, uh, the Berlin Film Festival, mm -hmm. yeah? I haven't caught up with it yet, and I'm going to make sure that I do. But just watching the clip that we have just shown to yep. our viewers, it's very, very good production values. It's a re it looks like a remarkably well-made yep, movie, it yeah? Is. How, how, how high was the budget? Do you happen to know? I don't, actually. It wasn't very high. Uh -huh. She did it all herself. She was her own camera, uh, camera woman, yeah. and she cut herself and did, did, did it all basically by herself. But what a, what a story it is, but yeah. then what a very talented uh, yeah, young woman she must be. Yeah, she's very, very talented, be. yes, absolutely, yeah. she is. And what, hap what happens if you get involved in crowdfunding and the project flops? The, pro the project you know, leads nowhere. That's that. That's that. C'est la vie. You yeah. have a box of cookies, uh, anyway. Exactly. <laughs> and there's not just a box. You, you mentioned the recipes. Just tell me a little bit about the cookbook. because uh, Yeah, Oma I, and Bella, they did a cookbook. Um, I think it was part of the project, actually, to, um, yeah, to keep their way of cooking alive mm -hmm. and to, uh, to write down the recipes for all eternity. <laughs> <laughs> and they produced a really charming little cookbook, Oma mm -hmm. and Bella's cookbook. It's, 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 it's really it's, it's hefty Jewish cuisine. Mm -hmm. You won't get hungry after been to, to you, Oma's you, you have a copy of the cookbook yes, and you I have do. cooked according yeah, yeah, to no, it. I yeah, haven't I can cooked tell. it yet. No, ah. I just read it. I love reading cookbooks. I don't need to cook. I just need to read. Exactly. <laughs> I've put it on my I've put it on my to do list because yeah, I, I need do. the film. I need to see the film now, and I need yeah. to I need the cookbook. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful looking cookbook. Get hold of it, folks. Yeah. Um, we were talking about the lessons that you'd learned while you were travelling. Mm. Yeah. And one of them I'm very curious about because because um, the, the film Uma and Bella is a film essentially about friendship. Right. That much is clear to me. Yeah. Um, and you say in your book, uh, more than one place in the book, I think you say you want to sort of organise your life, reinvent your life a little bit, so there's going to be more space for yourself. Right. And more space for friendship. For friends, yeah. yeah it's easy to say those things mm. when you're on the road, mm. when you're on a high, when you're writing a book. Mm. You do it in real life. I struggle, mm -hmm. obviously, because once you get back home, real life or your old life takes over again. And it's really hard to continue living the life uh, you do on the road. I really have to admit that it is, it is a struggle, yes. Yeah. But I decided uh, that I wanted to, to, to work less, live more, and that's what I'm doing, yes. And I, uh, but I still have to fight the urge and other people's urges to make me work. Yeah. They offer me interesting, intriguing little projects, and I, uh, I, I'm, I'm very bad at saying no, but I'm getting better at it, yes. Mm. And uh, just to come, the word home interests me a lot, because mm. you've just used it, and you, you talked about coming home and being at home. Yeah. Where is home for you? And uh, are you clear about that these days? After this year, mm. it's become even more muddled, I mm. think because there were so many places where I felt at home instantaneously, like London or San Francisco, I yeah. could live there right away. Just give me any place and I could move there in a second, no problem. Yeah. But uh, in Germany, it's Hamburg, because I always thought of this city as a very uh, free, uh, a liberal city, um, very free. It's called the Free and Hansestadt Hamburg, so it is in its name anyway. And you know, it's it's a port, it's a harbor city, so you always have this notion of um, the world at the horizon. I love that. Yeah? I love that about Hamburg. You yeah. uh, go there to the harbor, you see the big ships mm. passing by, and you you know your your mind and your heart goes on that journey, on that ship, I think. So mm -hmm. it always has this feeling of um, the world in, in the city, in a way. It's, I always like that. I like the, the, uh, the movement there, the freedom. Wonderful. <laughs>
And uh, have you been policed in any way no. around the situation? No. no. no? So At it's all. not as strict in Hamburg as no, no, it is no. down it there in, in, no. in Saxony. Thank God it isn't. Um, no. Well, you're talking about adventure, exploration, experiment, risk, <laughs> and you have a dog. That's a risk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true, true, true. And Good it point. is an yeah, adventure. Yeah, yeah. The risk is, yeah. will it survive? <laughs> no, the, it is an adventure. It's living with the creature, you know. It, you mm. can't really talk back. It is uh, quite an adventure, I find, yeah. and it uh, teaches me quite a lot of things. For instance, discipline. Mm. Not one of my forties, but now I have to learn it to, you know, impose it on him. Mm. But I was very surprised, you know, because I, I do my own research on my guests here on the show, but I'm also <laughs> given a dossier and I was very surprised. I, I read about you and then I read about this and that and the other and going all around the world and doing all these kind of yeah. experiments. And then it said, she's just got herself a dog. And I thought, well, that, but that ties you down. It does in a way, but then again, not as much as you would imagine. Mm -hmm. um, I can travel with this dog, no sure. problem. Okay. It really doesn't yeah. tie yeah. me down that much. Obviously, I have to take some precautions. I have to make some arrangements, yeah. Mm. But uh, it's not a totally different life. I can continue my life, you know. It's, it must be one of, the, uh, one of the world's greatest and longest examples of delayed gratification. Because... Absolutely. I wanted <laughs> a dog why, since, yeah. Yeah, I wanted a dog since I've been a child and, uh, and my, my parents gave me a butchery do, is that what it's called? A budgery do. Budgery do. A I like the word budgery do. Let's call it a budgery gar though. Butchery what? A budgery gar. Butchery it's not gar. a word that I'm comfortable with. But it's with. a budgie. A budgie, exactly. A budgie. A budgie. Anyway, they gave me a budgie. Mm which was not quite the same thing. No. Nope. Yeah. But, uh, you know, since then it's been festering my mind and I finally now, now is the time to do it. Okay, okay. Let's talk about another thing that you're doing to fulfill sort of maybe a dream that you've had or maybe just a very, very good idea. We've talked about Hamburg. Right. Perhaps your home city, for example, or certainly that much we've established. Uh, you're going to go on a trip around Germany for right. a whole year, 12, yeah. 12 cities, 12 same, cities. same principle, much, applied to Germany. Much the same principle, yes. Is Hamburg on the list? It no, can't obviously be. not. I know it too well. No, uh, after I came home from that world trip, I thought, you know, I know the world by now quite well. Mm -hmm. I don't know the first thing about my own country. Yeah. And I need to change that. Mm -hmm. I need to get acquainted and reacquainted with my own country. Where yeah. am I from? You know, yeah. who am I? So that's what I'm going to do next year and, and get to know my own country and spend one month each in a small German city next have, year. Have you got the list? Have you, ah, not, small, you said small German. Yes, so small, we're talking about not, a sort of no, no, medium-sized place. Uh, not, Ham not Hamburg, not Berlin Hamburg, and Munich. Not they Munich. obviously too big, not um, Have you got some Cologne. examples? Erfurt, for instance. Erfurt in Eastern yes. Germany. Görlitz, yeah. Eastern Germany. A very Stralsund, attractive place. Yeah. Lüneburg, Constance, oh, yeah. on Lake Constance. Mm -hmm. um, in the Ruhrgebiet, I need something. The industrial, uh, the industrial Ruhr area. The um, industrial core of Germany. I don't know the first thing about it. Okay. So, all over the place, really. What I liked about your book, I like many things about your book, but one thing that was very good was you had, you had a list at the end of, of really, really good tips for travellers. Mm. Can you condense it into three good tips oh for goodness, us? You've got 30 uh, seconds. Oh dear, the most important is don't plan, go. <laughs> Just go. Don't plan, Give go. Give yourself... Uh, to, to um, open your open yourself up to chances, you know. Mm -hmm. Don't use travel guides, but use you know stuff like Time Out magazines. Do go where the people go. Where the um, what else? <sighs> Eat as much as you can. <laughs> <coughs> We'll yeah. leave it there. <laughs> That's my favourite tip. It's always a good one, yeah? That is your lot with, I've already called her wise, and she's been very entertaining. Uh, Micah Vinamood, great stuff. Uh, if you've enjoyed the show as much as I have, then do come back next week. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss. <laughs>